session to the professor papo so papo you can deliver the lecture i think okay thank you thank you sir. um so i'll speak about astrophysics so i suspect that for most of you it would be just a kind of educational uh talk uh, but i'm going to speak about a very hot subject and uh, quite often in mass media you can hear you can see you can read news about these um, fast radio bursts it's a puzzle these uh, transients are still not completely understood and i'll try to show you many many slides with uh, all phenomenology and with many theoretical approaches um developed in this field and uh, so finally i will come to intermediate say conclusions because uh the puzzle is still not solved okay um so let me start with an introductory slide because um you can ask a very obvious question why uh, the puzzle of this fast radio bursts is so new why it is very difficult to study transients in radio astrophysics the problem is in technology typically when people perform radio observations they are dealing with very narrow field instruments it's very difficult to make a kind of all sky survey and that is why mostly in radio astronomy people uh, study persistent sources which are not drastically uh, variable or they can be very variable but they also have persistent emission so it is quite easy to discover such sources and then you can study them in details and finally um, discover their variability on the plot uh, you see um, um a uh, uh, a diagram say uh, on the vertical axis the luminosity is presented and on the horizontal axis uh, roughly duration of um, the transient event and there are very different transients uh, mostly of course sources are variable there are stars there are active galactic nuclei so supermassive black holes in centers of galaxies of course there are radio pulsars here they are and here on the left and on the top you see fast radio bursts so obviously they are significantly shifted from all other types of radio transients they are very short they have millisecond duration and they are very intense so their intrinsic luminosity is very high it's like a billion luminosities of the sun purely in radio wavelengths and uh, so from the very beginning i would say it was clear that we are dealing with something new something very interesting and uh, atypical okay let me present a brief history the first paper was published on the subject in 2007 by dan clorimer um then there was the second event only 5 years later and uh, the main burst of activity started in 2013 after the paper by thorton and his co-authors in 2016 the first repeating source was discovered which was a major discovery because for the very first time it allowed to localize the source to find the host galaxy of this source and so to start studying it in details okay uh, about the first burst uh, the first paper was published as i said in 2007 uh, from the very beginning it was clear that we are dealing with something very interesting and the paper was published in science so in one of two main scientific journals in the world uh the burst came out from nowhere so it was say a kind of blank part of the sky no nearby galaxies no interesting sources just there was a very strong burst and what you see on the plot on the left this line um you know that the uh, that electromagnetic waves propagate with what we call velocity of light 
in vacuum, uh, then the velocity is unique for all wavelengths. But if an electromagnetic wave propagates in plasma, then high frequency signal um, propagates with larger velocity and low frequency signals with lower velocities. So there is delay. And on the vertical axis here you see frequency and on the horizontal axis time, which represents delay. And you clearly see that the signal is significantly delayed. So it's milliseconds and it's a really a very significant effect. How it can be? It means that on the line of sight, on the trajectory of this electromagnetic wave, there were lots of electrons in plasma. And we can clearly see that all plasma in our galaxy in this direction is not enough. So the source must be A, extragalactic, B, very, very far away source. So the distance might be very large in order to obtain this large delay uh, in arrival. So it was possible to uh, estimate the distance and it came out that the distance is several billion light years. So uh, about one gigaparsec. If you calculate then the luminosity of the source, it appears to be very large, 10 to 43 ergs per second. In uh, astrophysics, we usually use CGS units, not as high. And uh, 10 to 43 ergs per second, it's several billions of the solar luminosity. And here it's only in radio wave. A uh, few words about the dispersion measure. Uh, Dispersion merger shows you how significantly the signal is delayed. So how many electrons are on the line of sight. And the time delay is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. And this coefficient here is this dispersion measure. So it's integral along the trajectory of the number density of electrons. So uh, you obtain this number and it tells you how many electrons are on the line of sight and uh, then you can calculate distance. Uh, we can do it for our galaxy, I will not stop on it uh, in details. Our galaxy has a spiral structure and uh, then electron density is higher in these spiral arms, but we can all take it into account and for this source it was clear that galaxy is not enough. So you can make a t-shirt with a sign, with a um, writing, galaxy is not enough. And then this uh, nice plot of uh, the first fast radio burst. Okay, um, maybe I'll skip it. So the first event, uh, as I said, was found uh, occasionally. It was serendipitous discovery. Uh, people were observing this region near uh, the Magellanic Cloud. These uh, funny circles represent the diagram of sensitivity of the radio telescope in parts in Australia. And uh, uh, the source was discovered uh, as a bright source just in one beam uh, of this diagram. And uh, the field here is not very small, I'll show you later, it's about the size of the moon on the sky. Uh, but there is nothing interesting inside, uh, and the source was very bright. In radio astronomy, they use funny uh, units called Jansky, and uh, 30, 40 Jansky is a lot. Typically, radio sources have luminosities like Mille Jansky, and this was uh, like several tens of thousands um, brighter. Uh, history uh, seemed to be repeating. Maybe you know that in the late 60s, with the system of um, American satellites, VILA, which were spy satellites to look for nuclear tests in uh, then in USSR and China. Uh, they discovered uh, gamma ray bursts, which actually came from nowhere, from the universe somewhere. And it was a puzzle for more than 20 years. Only in the late 90s, people understood what are these uh, gamma ray bursts. Uh, they came out to be cosmological events with huge energy release. And now it looks like we have the same. There are um, mysterious radio bursts on the other side of the uh, range of electromagnetic waves. And uh, it also, they also come from nearly blank field. Uh, localization is very poor. It's very difficult to understand what they are. So people uh, made many hypotheses about it. And I'll talk about it during my talk. 
Um, so uh, the second event appeared five years later, and it was not so spectacular. Also, it was in the galactic plane, in the plane of the Milky Way. And so there were um, kind of discussions um, if they are really cosmological or not. Um, also, people started to find funny signals in radio telescopes, which got a very funny name, peritones. Uh, so you see it's a deer with wings, and it's from Wikipedia, you can go and check yourself what are peritones. They look to be uh, artificial signals, something coming maybe from Earth magnetosphere, maybe from some technological uh, devices around, but they looked very similar. They were also millisecond. They show kind of dispersion measure, but you see the line is patchy. Uh, so it's not a smooth line like in the case of the Lorimer burst, but still, these events were numerous. There were dozens of them discovered, and uh, really cosmological FRBs are, as we know now, uh, were just two at that time. So there were doubts if this is really an important problem in astrophysics. But the situation drastically changed in July um, 2013, when a paper by Thornton appeared, and they presented four clear examples of fast radio bursts. And actually, in this paper, they suggested the name fast radio bursts. And from this uh, point, people understood that we're dealing with something really astrophysical. In addition, very soon, these two ladies in Australia discovered what are peritons. It's a very funny step to read it. And this paper uh, in which they describe it is really interesting. It's a very interesting piece of science. Uh, when people are dealing with noise, with uh, fake signals, how they control it. So peritons came from microwave ovens at the observatory. It, it was uh, a kind of epic fail, because of course, you should not use such devices in the observatory, be very careful with them. Uh, but as people never worked with such rapid transients, they didn't care about tiny signals of these microwaves, uh, but it came out that uh, they produce them, and uh, potentially they could be mixed with fast radio bursts, but uh, thanks to these two ladies, now we know uh, what are peritons and what are fast radio bursts. Okay, so um, the problem of fast radio bursts became pure astrophysics at that time, and um, as we'll see later, people start to suggest theories. But of course, to deal with theories, you need experiments or observations, because you need to reject theories, you need to exclude them. And uh, finally, uh, like Sherlock Holmes told us, uh, when you exclude all impossible variants, the one which is left is real, even if it also seems to be impossible. So um, people suggested many theories, but uh, you need observations. And uh, what was important that uh, up to May uh, 2014, all fast radio bursts were found in archives. So people uh, offline months or maybe years later reduced data uh, very carefully with new algorithms. It's very difficult to find short non-repeating bursts in radio astronomy. Uh, so they carefully reduced the data looking for these bursts. And uh, then of course you cannot follow up. It happened five years ago, something bumped in the sky and that's all. Um, in 14, people finally were able to find uh, the burst online immediately and immediately trigger additional observations in other wavelengths. Because if something is bursting, presumably you can expect signals in optics, in gamma rays, in X-rays, but you have to look quickly, you have to do it rapidly. And uh, people triggered observations in other wavelengths and uh, they excluded known bright transients like supernovae, like uh, gamma ray bursts, which we already discussed, and several other types of transients. It was very important. So known types of bright um, catastrophic events with huge energy release were rejected by these observations. So at first only uh, the radio telescope in parks in Australia discovered fast radio bursts, then other instruments started to take part in this astrophysics. 
And um, now we have more than 100 reported bursts. I didn't check, maybe now it's like 118 or something. I checked a few days ago. Um, and uh, as you see, many radio telescopes all over the world in the southern uh, hemisphere, in the northern hemisphere, are observing fast radio bursts. And of course, much more instruments participate in follow ups. And uh, you can look at the catalog on the special website dedicated to this field of studies. Uh, still, in astronomy, to uh, study sources, we need to localize them very well. So you can look with many different telescopes in working in different wavelengths in this particular tiny piece of the sky to see what is happening there. But uh, for single short bursts in radio, it's, uh, it was impossible to localize it precisely. And it's still impossible with, say, one telescope. So Parks is one. Uh, this is the funny uh, picture of uh, the beams of sensitivity of this radio telescope. And as you see, the size of uh, this circle is about the size of the moon, half of degree on the sky. Uh, so it was impossible to localize the source with better than 10 arc minutes accuracy with parts. It's not enough for astronomy. So uh, the first years of studies were, uh, say, dark and obscured because uh, of impossibility to localize the source precisely. The situation changed when the first repeating source of um, fast radio bursts was discovered. It was done with a very large antenna with the Arecibo telescope. It's famous because it was used for different programs for searching of extraterrestrial intelligence, for example. Uh, the importance here is that it is huge. So it, can, it is sensitive to very weak signals. And they, follow, uh, they made follow-up for uh, one of uh, sources of FRB. So there was one bright burst. They uh, follow up and they found many other events. At first it was 10 events, now it's like 1,000 events, I think in a few years discovered from this source. It is important because if the source is repeating, you can start a joint program with many telescopes all over the globe and with a kind of triangulation, you can pinpoint the source on the sky with extreme precision. And it was done thanks to uh, different um, telescopes working all together in states, in Europe, all over the world. So you see here the list names of telescopes, dates, and you see that there are simultaneous discoveries uh, which allow to um, localize the source very precisely. So people found the galaxy and not only, they even found the exact place inside the faraway galaxy um, where the source is situated. It's really a faraway galaxy. One gigaparsec is like three billion years, slightly uh, light years, slightly more. And the galaxy is unusual. It's a dwarf galaxy with very high rate of star formation. It means that there are lots of massive stars with short lifetimes. These stars explode like uh, as um, supernova, produce young neutron stars and black holes. So it became clear that FRBs are linked to a um, young population, uh, most probably with neutron stars, I'll come to it later. So this is a very precise localization of the uh, source of the fast radio bursts, and it is situated not just in a galaxy with high star formation rate, but exactly in the region of extremely high star formation. So that was very interesting and important. As uh, the source is repeating, uh, it is possible to trigger uh, programs not only with radio telescopes, but with different telescopes. And people started to monitor this source with uh, very sensitive telescopes of different kinds. Uh, in the first place with X-ray telescopes, Chandra and XMM, two uh, major observatories in space were used for that, and uh, they found nothing. The same uh, zero result was obtained for gamma rays. Uh, this data 
from Fermi, and not only for the repeating source, but for other sources too. Uh, also, it was, uh, well, different FRBs were monitored with the Indian satellite AstroSat. It's an X-ray satellite. Also, uh, it gave um, zero identification. And uh, up to now, we don't have any counterparts for extragalactic fast radio bursts. Um, people understood that finding repeating sources is very important, but it's very difficult to do. It was difficult until a special new instrument appeared. It's a telescope uh, called CHIME. You can see it uh, on the photo, uh, and it is situated in Canada. Canada is a kind of good because um, it's in the northern hemispheres. Before, uh, main instruments were in the southern hemisphere in Australia like Parks, Atmos, Ascap, now Mirkat in South Africa. And uh, CHIME started uh, to operate in 2018, and um, relatively quickly they found um, another repeating source. Then the third repeating source was found in Australia with the system of radio telescopes Ascap. Uh, and then CHIME started to present many repeating sources. In the first set, they presented eight repeating sources. Actually, they are not so very repeating. Some of them produce just three bursts. Uh, not so much, but still it is important. Uh, we collect data, we improve statistics. And uh, studies of uh, repeating bursts um, allowed to make another important discovery. Uh, this year in January, so all the science I'm telling you is really very new and the uh, situation is changing very quickly. So this January people announced uh, the first uh, clear example of periodicity in FRB bursts. Actually, they not work like a clock, say. Um, it's more like, more like I'm going to the university, okay, now we are um, working from home because of COVID, but still. Uh, it doesn't mean that I appear in the university every day exactly at 9 o'clock in the morning and stay till 6 in the evening, for example, no. But there is some periodicity in my appearance in the university. I appear, say, in a day time, uh, on working days, and uh, I don't appear at the university deep in the night, for example, or early in the morning, I hate up, wake up early. Uh, so more or less the same uh, works for FRB, for this particular FRB. Uh, people found uh, 16 days periodicity. Uh, so during this period of activity, you can detect uh, bursts and you don't detect uh, out of uh, some particular phases of this 16 days period. So till now, we don't know the origin of this periodicity. Most probably it's a binary system. So a neutron star, which produces fast radio bursts, rotates around a massive star, for example, but other options are also discussed A neutron star can process, for example. So it's a interesting subject because you can invent many different hypotheses and play with them. Um, so, uh, last set of repeating sources uh, from CHIME included uh, nine sources and they have a special catalog of their, uh, detected on this radio telescope, of their repeating bursts and uh, if you are interested you can see the list here. Okay. Um, Step by step, people started to localize uh, more and more fast radio bursts. And here the main player is uh, ASCAP. Uh, it's Australian pathfinder for the SKA um, radio telescope system. What is important, um, because ASCAP is not a single telescope, but a system of telescopes, they work like an interferometer all together and they can uh, localize even a single burst very precisely. And that's good because uh, we have still very few repeating sources and a lot of non-repeating sources. Uh, so um, the other important uh, piece of information you get from uh, such observation is the type of galaxy because some galaxies contain lots of young stars, neutron stars and so on. Supernova explode very often there, and life is interesting. Uh, 
Uh, some galaxies are rolled and dull. And uh, in this case, uh, the source was found in a galaxy uh, which is classified as a lenticular galaxy or an early type galaxy. And it has relatively low star formation rate. So it's very interesting to put all these pieces of information all together. The third localization came from the, another instrument, DSA-10. It's also a set of uh, antennas, uh, a set of radio telescopes, and they also could look and can localize uh, non-repeating bursts. And uh, it's, again, another type of galaxy. So uh, let me remind you, the first was a dwarf galaxy with very high star formation. The second was galaxy with very low star formation. The third was a massive galaxy with the uh, intermediate star formation. So it's, mm, well, sometimes, of course, it's disappointing that uh, they're not alike, but uh, it actually makes life di interesting, uh, diverse, and uh, it's much more difficult to uh, fit your model, fit your hypothesis to uh, satisfy all these um, observational results. Um, the first localization was important because um, here, as it was predicted before, um, fast radio bursts could be used as a probe of uh, intergalactic medium. Um, in astrophysics, we cannot do experiments, so we have only observations, and we need variety of very precise uh, observations to uh, understand properties of different sources. And fast radio bursts are very good in this sense because uh, they're very short bursts. Uh, so it's really like a probe. You know, for example, uh, when uh, underground nuclear explosions were allowed, it was uh, good for geosciences because uh, they produce sound waves, uh, seismic waves, which propagates through the Earth and different seismic stations all over the Earth could uh, record the signal, and we learned a lot about the internal structure of our Earth. So um, people needed some special signals. Still, I agree that uh, nuclear um, tests is uh, not a very good and safe thing. Uh, but in astrophysics, we're dealing with natural phenomena. And in this sense, FRBs are safe and uh, good for us. Uh, so they work like such probes, which um, allow uh, you to understand properties of matter on the trajectory of the electromagnetic wave on the line of sight. And so uh, the source was not only localized, but it was understood that it passed through a halo of a galaxy on the way. And so we can understand properties of matter in the galaxy. And it was just the first step. I'll show you later a very fresh and important result. Uh, with another burst, it was possible to probe, he to, to probe halos of mm, known nearby galaxies, M33, so-called triangular mm, galaxies, not because it has a shape of triangle, but because it is in the constellation triangle, and M31, which is better known as the Andromeda galaxy. Um, then there was the fifth localization. Okay, I'll skip it. And recently in May, this year appeared a set of papers, actually, it was not a single paper, um, by ASCAP, in which they presented four new localizations. And what is important, they used um, several localizations, uh, well, all obtained by this team, to uh, probe baryonic density in the universe. So it was, of course, a nature paper. And they uh, confirmed this known result that about 5% of matter in the universe is in the usual uh, form, which, uh, which is closer to your site. Mm. So normal matter is what you can find in the uh, periodic table, uh, hydrogen and helium mainly. And uh, for the very first time, it was possible really to see, uh, to measure this baryonic density in different directions very precisely. Uh, and I think it's the most direct way now to prove the baryonic density in the universe in astronomy. Okay, uh, another thing about fast radio bursts, which is puzzling, which is impressive, but which I didn't mention yet. The funny thing is that they are extremely frequent, 
extremely. Uh, imagine there are up to 10,000 bursts in the sky in a day. Of course, we observe a tiny amount of this huge number because, as I said, radio telescopes have very narrow field of view. But uh, these events are very frequent in the universe. They are very powerful, but um, before 2007, we didn't, we didn't know about them at all. And uh, only seven years ago, even slightly less than seven years ago, we um, started to... Uh, study this phenomenon in details. We obtain some non-negligible statistics and so on. But they happen very often. Nearly every time you breathe, roughly, there is a fast radio burst somewhere in the universe. Th that's really impressive. Um, but uh, to proceed with understanding of physical mechanism, we need more physical data. And another important result was related to discovery of polarization of fast radio burst emission. And it was done for the very first time in um, 2014 uh, for this burst, uh, which was the first one um, identified online immediately. Uh, and then uh, people measured several other examples, and now we have like a dozen of uh, fast radio bursts with measured polarization. What does it mean? It means that um, there is significant magnetic field in the site of uh, emission. And it uh, not very directly, but actually points towards neutron stars. Because later, I hope to come to a huge list of hypotheses, and different hypotheses was uh, put forward. Uh, but uh, neutron stars from the very beginning was, um, I would say, a leading approach. Of course, even with neutron stars, you can imagine, you can invent many types of hypotheses. But um, neutron stars are really the best. Also, we can make a t-shirt, neutron stars are the best. And uh, measurements of polarization, um, relatively clearly points towards neutron stars. Okay, so let me come to uh, the list of hypotheses. Actually, there is a special review about hypotheses about the nature of fast radio bursts. And you can find it and there'll be a reference to it later on. Uh, so uh, I here listed just uh, 12 hypotheses. There are much more and each of them has many variants. So I quickly pass through um, some of them. Roughly, um, the, uh, these hypotheses can be divided in two main classes, neutron stars and exotics. Uh, neutron stars, I told already, already why. Why exotics? Because, well, imagine that you are a theoretical physicist. So you are studying some funny things which most probably don't exist in nature. It's quite natural. And uh, um, some years ago, we made a popular science movie with a colleague, and um, there were several interviews inside. And a uh, prominent Russian young theoretical physics said uh, a very interesting and important thing, in my opinion. He said, uh, so it's a quotation, uh, in my opinion, theoretical physicists must study things which do not exist in nature because things that do exist in nature will be discovered in experiments and we can study uh, in theory we can study what could exist in the universe but for some reason doesn't exist at least in our universe and of course uh, okay so you are a theoretical physicist you have funny ideas you published this idea once and did somehow unpolite to publish it twice Yes, because it's still the same idea. And when you get a tiny chance to say that your idea is probably related to a new experiment or to a new uh, observational result, you immediately write the paper. So people working on different exotics uh, in theoretical physics, in theoretical astrophysics, when they uh, got an opportunity to link their favorite idea with fast radio bursts, of course, they immediately grabbed this chance and published a paper. So there was there were several actually papers that faster radio bursts are produced by cosmic strings. Uh, personally, I think that cosmic strings do not exist in our universe, uh, but they can potentially. 
and potentially they can produce um, bursts. Um, when people presented the second um, fast radio bursts, um, they um, uh, noted that it can be related to evaporation of a primordial black hole. I remind you that uh, Martin Rees proposed, and I think also Blanford, uh, proposed uh, already in 70s that um, latest stages of black hole evaporation can also produce a radio burst. And actually it's much easier to detect a radio burst, of course, if you are looking towards it, than for example, a gamma ray burst. And uh, you can read even in Wikipedia the history of developing the Wi-Fi technology. And you can see there that the major step was made by radio astronomer, by John O'Sullivan. And actually he came to radio astronomy with the hope to find uh, evaporating black holes. So everything is mixed with everything. Everything is linked with everything. Um, then many types of hypotheses dealing with neutron stars um, exploit such an idea. You have to do something with the, with the magnetosphere of neutron star. You, can, you have to shake it to, I don't know, produce some major perturbation in it. And people studied many scenarios how they can do it. For example, a binary system, a neutron star with a magnetosphere and a massive star, the massive star explodes as a supernova and the shock front hit the magnetosphere of the neutron star and it potentially can produce bursts. Also, there was a paper of this kind. You can um, perturbate the magnetosphere of a neutron star with something different, with a gamma ray burst, with the active galactic nuclear activity, and people also studied this. There and of course, you can perturb one neutron neutron star with another. You can uh, look at coalescences of neutron stars. And of course it was discussed and it was quite popular for maybe two years, uh, especially when people identified a fast radio burst in an old galaxy with low star formation. I hope you remember that was the second localization. Uh, it is important because um, neutron stars coalesce when they are old enough. So you don't expect that it happens very often in a young galaxy. Uh, they need to live a life before they coalesce with each other. And such an event also potentially can produce radio bursts. Um, you can coalesce not neutron stars, but white dwarfs. You can also uh, have a collapse of a neutron star to a black hole. You can um, form after a supernova explosion or after coalescence, for example, a very massive neutron star, they're called supermassive neutron star. Uh, for example, Microsoft Office doesn't know this word, and every time I write supermassive neutron star, it tries to uh, suggest that they are supermassive, not supermassive. No, these are different. Supermassive and supermassive are two different words. Um, so supermassive neutron stars, they might collapse to a black hole, but they are still stable because they are rapidly rotating. When they gradually slow down, finally they collapse. And this, as was um, put forward in this hypothesis, uh, can produce a fast radio burst. If black hole is not enough, you can use a white hole. And there was a very interesting paper in Nature, you can find it, um, about white hole evaporation in loop string gravity. Uh, it's quite interesting, you can produce much more powerful bursts than in the case of usual black holes. Um, you can use exotic particles, for example, axions. Axons in the, uh, the these are particles uh, not from the standard model, but mostly physicists believe that they are real. Um, they are very important, but indirect indications that these particles are very, how say, welcomed by theoretical physics. Um, so uh, there is so-called Primakov process. Um, axons can. Um, be converted to photons in the magnetic field. So axons are um, discussed as candidates for the dark matter. This means that they are very abundant in the universe. So this means that they can be very abundant in the universe. And if a cloud of axions pass through magnetosphere of a neutron star, they can all together start to be converted to photons 
And so you will see a burst of electromagnetic emission. We don't know uh, the exact value of masses of these particles, and it is possible, as it was speculated, that uh, masses are in the range that allows you to produce a radio emission after a conversion. Uh, what else you can do with the neutron star? You can, uh, uh, you can transform it to a quark star. So normally quarks are confined in uh, protons and neutrons, but uh, there is a hypothesis that at high density, um, another uh, state of matter is the ground state and it's quark matter. Uh, sometimes it's called strange uh, matter because you need the third quark, the strange quark. And uh, it can happen uh, by itself in, in dense media inside a neutron star. And of course, if it happens, the whole structure of a neutron star is very rapidly changed. And um, in response to this uh, perturbation, the magnetosphere also uh, rapidly changes and it can produce a burst. Uh, finally, you can throw something on a neutron star, so something very uh, sort of natural, throw something uh, on a neutron star and produce a burst. And people still discuss, even today in the morning, check the archive. Uh, maybe I have to mm, make a note. I'm sure that you're all familiar with it still. Uh, I refer to all publications with their numbers in the archive, so on the site archive for uh, and this morning, uh, before the lecture, I checked uh, the um, archive, and again there was another paper about asteroids falling on neutron stars producing fast radio bursts. So potentially uh, it also can work. But the main uh, model now is related to activity of a very particular type of neutron stars, of magnetars. Magnetars are not just neutron stars with high magnetic field. Magnetar means that the luminosity, the activity of this neutron star is determined by the energy stored in the magnetic field. So magnetic field has energy. Um, so the energy density, the magnetic pressure is B squared divided by A pi. Uh, and um, magnetic energy can be significant. What is more important is that you can very rapidly release it. Because finally, uh, we're dealing with currents. and you can very rapidly, with a shortcut, um, get energy from a current. So as you remember, in the first part of uh, Back to the Future, uh, when their nuclear engine was not working, they used um, a lightning gap uh, to, uh, to power the engine. So uh, it's a very good way to um, obtain a very huge energy release in a short time. And, uh, Immediately in 2007, in the C print, we proposed that uh, fast radio bursts can be related to magnetars. And a few years later, uh, Yuri Lebarsky developed the first model. Now there are many. And again, this morning, there was another paper with developing uh, this um, line of calculations. Um, Yuri Lebarsky developed a model in which um, a huge uh, magnetic hydrodynamic pulse propagating after a flare of a magnetar hits um, a nebula around the neutron star and it can produce coherent maser actually radio emission. And this uh, direction of uh, modeling is very popular now and I would say it's one of two most probable mechanisms explaining the FRP activity. Uh, new observations help to exclude some models because people observe if there are FBRs in the direction of recent gamma ray bursts, uh, specific types of supernova, uh, short gamma ray bursts, and so on, I'd skip it. Uh, also recently, you see the paper it was appeared in the archive just in May. People analyzed the set of galaxies and uh, concluded that the whole set is better compatible with the magnetar model. This variety of galaxies in which we observe sources of fast radio bursts are better explained uh, by the magnetar model and not uh, by um, other types of models. And uh, from the point of view of rate, uh, magnetars can allow you to have this high rate of events 
so on the left plot, you see the luminosity. Actually, that's a minimum luminosity which goes in some populations. I have no time to go in details. And on the vertical axis, the distance, uh, oh, sorry, the rate um, in numbers in uh, cubic gigaparsec in a year. And uh, this um, dark gray shows you uh, the expectations. Uh, so actually, you have to come to this point on the left uh, from observations, and you see that just soft gamma repeaters, so magnetars, can explain the dub. Uh, also, it can be explained by white dwarf, white dwarf mergers, but there are no reliable mechanisms to produce emission now. So, um, I'm uh, coming maybe uh, to the end of the main part. Uh, early ideas included many possibilities to explain uh, fast radio bursts, but gradually people closed all the exotic mechanisms, all catastrophic mechanisms are mostly closed. Why I'm saying mostly? Because um, it's not for granted that FRBs are a unique population of sources. Maybe there are sources of different kind. And maybe, for example, um, gamma ray bursts or coalescence of neutron stars contribute a little bit on a level of percents to the whole population, uh, about this percent or 10% uh, level effect we're not aware at the moment. But uh, catastrophic events cannot explain all the whole populations of fast radio bursts. Um, Compact objects plus something also cannot explain the whole population. So the mainstream is related to single neutron stars. Either um, they are releasing the energy of the magnetic field, as in magnetars, or maybe, but less probable now, I would say, and in a few minutes I'll explain why, uh, the activity of fast radio bursts can be related to rotational energy losses, like in radio pulsars. So we can compare these two um, approaches and, uh, okay, I have no much time to discuss it. I would say that magnetars win over pulsars um, basing on many but indirect uh, arguments. So the magnetar model was developed in several papers. I'll skip it. Um, Last August appeared an important paper by Andrei Belobarodov in which I think he presented a very interesting and detailed model. And this morning, actually, he and his collaborators presented another paper. Uh, indeed, we observed nebulous around magnetars. So nebulous around these types of neutron star, this type of neutron stars can be in the game. Uh, it doesn't contradict and it is supported, I would say, by astrophysics. But but um, all the way, there was a big question. We know galactic magnetar. Why don't we see fast radio bursts from the galactic magnetar? And uh, galactic magnetars were the last uh, heroes in mass media in relation to fast radio bursts. So the first um, short radio burst uh, from a known galactic magnetar was detected um, last year. And uh, it really looks like a fast radio burst, but uh, there are also some differences. And recently appeared a paper in which they studied many uh, this millisecond burst in the upper panel you see radio data. Um, the source produces bursts, but they look different from fast radio bursts. So uh, you cannot consider them as um, smaller analogs of uh, huge uh, transient events um, of fast radio bursts. Uh, but in April, in late April, happened uh, another thing. Another galactic magnetar, that's its name, soft gum repeater, and this funny number 1935 plus 2154 um, um, represents coordinates in the sky of this source. Uh, it's a known burster in, in X-rays and gamma rays, but in uh, late April, two radio telescopes, in the first place CHIME, discovered a huge and very short radio burst from this source. So a uh, burst consisted of two parts, each of uh, five millisecond width and like uh, 30 milliseconds between them. Uh, the second telescope 
it's not actually a telescope, a system with very, uh, of very tiny detectors. Um, the system is called STAIR-2. They also detected this burst, not that nice resolution, but uh, it's a clear detection. They have four detectors uh, separated by a huge distance, they're separated in the US. And what is important, simultaneously, with this uh, radio burst, uh, people detected um, an X-ray and gamma ray burst from the source. Actually, not simultaneously, because this dispersion we discussed earlier in the talk. Uh, there was a few seconds delay. Of course, uh, X-ray mission uh, came to the Earth uh, earlier, faster, because uh, low-frequency radio emission propagates with smaller velocity. But uh, you can calculate it, you can take it into account, and then you, you see that bursts were simultaneous on the side, in the place of emission, in, this, uh, in the vicinity of this neutron star. So the burst was detected by um, experiment conus on board the satellite wing. Um, it was detected by the satellite Agile, by uh, X-ray satellite HXMT and by integral. So I quickly skip it. And that's the first clear example that a known magnetar simultaneously produced a burst in X-rays, say at high energy, it also takes soft gamma rays, uh, simultaneous burst at high energy and in radio. And in radio, it looks exactly as a fast radio burst. And so many people really concluded that now we are sure that magnetars are sources of uh, fast radio bursts. Maybe it is a little bit premature because still we are dealing with a very scaled version because uh, the energetic of this event is a few orders of magnitude uh, smaller than classical fast radio bursts, so we need more observations. Okay, uh, so the current rating of hypothesis is uh, like this. Most probably we are dealing with magnetars. They can be young, they can be old, they can form through different channels. Uh, what we do not know exactly is the emission mechanism. We think that magnetars produce fast radio bursts, but we, but we don't know exactly how. Um, fast radio bursts can be used in theoretical physics. If you are interested, you can just look at the papers, so you can put limits on photon mass, on general relativity. It's quite interesting, maybe. And uh, what is more important is that we get more and more observations because the, um, the question, the problem of fast radio burst is very popular. Uh, it's very easy to publish in Nature and Science with it. And uh, many telescopes all over the world, including India, actively takes part in uh, studies of um, sources of fast radio bursts of magnetars and so on. So very nice in the telescope GMRT uh, in particular participate in it. And people build new telescopes and new facilities, new um, instruments uh, to study these types of transients. I quickly pass through them. You know that now the largest radio telescope is FAST in China. It has 500 meters in diameter. It's on the left here. They also work in the field of um, fast radio bursts. Uh, we have this funny, cheap, uh, but probably effective STAIR-2 systems. We hope that X-ray satellites uh, will help to find counterparts. Maybe it will be done with um, Irazita on board of Russian SPECTRG. Maybe it will be done by um, AstroSat or something else. And I'll stop here on time with my last slide. Uh, there are several reviews on fast radio bursts. Still, the field is very rapidly developing. So it's um, all these reviews, I would say, have very short life cycle. In a few years, in two years, they become too old. There is a catalog and um, there are a lot of sources now there. Uh, well, actually now, Nine are localized, but it's a very recent result, so I didn't change it here. Um, we, uh, in several cases, uh, we can measure details like polarization, rotation measure. And what is more important, people started to discover sources at low frequency. In particular, it's true for um, 
repeating sources because you can invest a lot of time in monitoring uh, this um, type of events. And uh, for repeating sources, the lowest frequency at which sources are detected is about 300 megahertz. Well, uh, so I'm stopping here. If uh, you have questions, you can write them down in the chat or ask. Uh, actually, for me, I understood it's a little bit easier 